describe for us um, an ordinary day in the life of Radio Haiti? Well, I think that ordinary day, as you say, uh, varied a bit depending on the years, because we're talking about 30 years of, uh, of history. Um, but in, in general, what uh, uh, we usually started at 6 o'clock in the morning, and we started with a news show in Creole. And we had another show at 7 o'clock, which was uh, uh, anchored by Jean-Dominique and by myself, uh, which lasted until 8.30. Uh, then after that, we had the music programs uh, uh, while uh, I was meeting with the newsroom and assigning a task to the newsroom. Um, and we had uh, uh, every day uh, those meetings with discussions about what they would be covering. In the meantime, we had uh, the radio, uh, you know, radio news pro uh, music programs going on and with a lot of stress on Haitian music and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of it on uh, Racine music, music from the countryside. Uh, we had uh, uh, our second, our second uh, group of uh, uh, news programs uh, at uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, and uh, at uh, uh, one o'clock, we had Micro Témoin, which was a magazine, uh, which was uh, about uh, actualities, things happening, but a more in-depth uh, approach to the events. That was in French. Uh, in the afternoon at four o'clock, we had a news magazine, uh, which became longer and longer as people really started uh, uh, expressing their interest for, uh, for the program. Uh, then uh, at uh, 6 o'clock, we had another news program in French, and at 9 o'clock, we had uh, a news program in Creole. So it was, toward the day, we had news programs. We had bulletins, news bulletins every hour. Uh, so news was really very much part of the life of the station. But at the same time, you know, we had programs on health. We had programs on, uh, during the day, programs on uh, um, you know, culture and uh, um, traditions. We had programs on, uh, um, we had jazz programs. We had, uh, um, you know, little tidbits about uh, cooking, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, uh, the life of uh, uh, everyday life in Haiti, the life of uh, uh, someone uh, selling shaved ice in downtown Port-au-Prince, about uh, a shoemaker. So, you know, we had, uh, even though the, we had those news slots, uh, we also had, uh, news was part of to us also covering everyday life, and that was inserted into different programs. You had interviews uh, within uh, uh, the jazz program about uh, uh, different things. You had the interviews during uh, the Racine program about, uh, uh, you know, voodoo. Uh, so it was, uh, uh, it was not just uh, news, but news was really part of, uh, of course, I'm talking from my perspective, which was a news perspective, but news was really everywhere, and there was uh, always that life uh, around news. Um, most of the, we had the 25 journalists uh, most of the time, uh, plus about 20 in working as stringers in the province towns. And uh, uh, through the phone, they would send us information about what was going on in the, the different towns where they were. And uh, we would, in case there was a breaking story, which was an important one, we would send uh, a reporter from Port-au-Prince to actually cover the story and support the uh, correspondent, was the, the, the stringer that we had uh, in that province town. So it was always uh, um, you know, a very dynamic uh, uh, relationship between the journalists in Port-au-Prince and the journalists in uh, uh, the, the different uh, towns. They would uh, let us know about what was brewing in one area, so we would uh, be sure to cover it. Uh, I have to say that uh, what made Radio Haiti unique is that even though it was a private radio station, Jean believed in what he was doing, and he believed that we should put money into covering the countryside. And we would assign journalists for a 15-day stay or a, a, a three-week stay somewhere so they would just cover a story and cover it completely. So it was, a, uh, it was an in-depth approach which did not exist in uh, other media, I'm afraid, and uh, uh, an in-depth approach also that uh, covered the country as a whole, not just Port-au-Prince. So that's really what made the difference at Radio Haiti. 
Um, in terms of daily life, uh, most of the journalists uh, who are covering the news came in for the meeting, uh, the news meeting in the morning at 8.30 until about uh, 9.30. 9.30, everyone was off to cover different uh, uh, things happening, whether it were press conferences or whatever was happening. Uh, they would come back uh, at 3 o'clock because uh, by 3, uh, I have to get the story in Creole. Already recorded in the studio the full story from each reporter. The same reporter would, after 4, after the, the, the 4 o'clock uh, news program, record the same story in French, even though the voices were always in Creole. But, you know, we had... Uh, you know, each reporter would cover, in fact, the story twice. They wrote two stories. And uh, this is what we have uh, at, in the Duke, at the Duke Library. We have kept most of the reporting in Creole, and we have most of our paper recordings in French. Uh, because it was, uh, uh, we didn't want to keep everything, but we wanted to keep a trace of what happened during, all, during that whole uh, uh, time uh, for 30 years. So we've been talking about these, there's news programs and then there's the sort of everyday life, cultural, music, um, but of course Haiti is a place where politics are part of everyday life, even things that aren't explicitly yes, it's true. political. And um, a lot of the music is indirectly, or directly, but also indirectly political and talking about, talking about justice and talking about those things. So. I guess, could you talk a little bit about, about what cultural programming like that means in a place like Haiti? Well, it was not, they were not uh, actually, uh, Jean had one program, which was a news program, uh, once a week, which was a magazine, and uh, on Sunday, which was probably the Easter uh, program during the time of the dictatorship, uh, where he would cover you know, news items uh, a little more in depth than we had covered during the, the, the week. Um, and he would use music from uh, artists from the diaspora who could say things we could not say. And, uh, uh, you know, listening to the songs right now while we are working on the, the, the Duke's archives, uh, is, it's amazing how much those songs said. And I think it is so much part of the story because. Of course, Jean had to do an, uh, an amount of, of self-censorship because we were working under Duvalier. Uh, but at the same time, the songs said things that we could not say. And uh, we use a lot of the artists living in the diaspora to say that. And uh, so our relationship with music was, uh, uh, was always a dynamic one and a political one. Uh, of course, not everything was political, but, uh, um, but you're right. Not everything seemed to be political, but everything is political. Uh, from uh, anyway, from cooking to uh, 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 yeah, to the garbage in the streets, as I was saying earlier, everything is political. And uh, um, we were. Uh, it's not just because we were political animals. It's just because uh, when you live, uh, when listening to the radio is a matter of life and death for people, to the extent that there is a demonstration in the street that is, you know, is turning violent. You usually in the morning, and during the, 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 from 1994 to 2000, you know, we people listen to the radio to know whether they should go out. And it was, it, it was a matter, when I say it was a matter of life and death, we mean it, you know? And for us, it was dangerous to be out in the streets, except that uh, because we had the support I mentioned, uh, it was uh, uh, when they were, uh, we could do it. Uh, we had the support, for instance, at a certain time when there were gang wars in Cité Soleil, which is a bidonville of Port-au-Prince, uh, Radio Haiti, because we had, you know, credentials, uh, if I can put it this way, in the popular neighborhoods, uh, Radio Haiti was allowed in. Well, even the police could not get in unless they came in with uh, heavy force. Uh, a number of radio stations could not get in. But we had some sort of a permanent visa. If you say Radio Haiti, you know, you, will, you go in. Of course, if you say Radio Haiti to a policeman, I'm not quite sure you have the same reaction. So it's, uh, it was, uh, um, 
uh, the way we function was very much, uh, you're true, you're right, it was, uh, uh, they were all political decisions, um, you know, even assigning people to different things, we know that was a political decision, even though sometimes we covered the energy crisis, sometimes we covered the, uh, you know, the, the lack of gasoline coming from Venezuela, of course, sometimes we covered, you know, I mean, there were uh, different things we covered, but that ultimately were political, you're quite right. You just started to tell us some of these behind the scenes kinds of stories about how the work was done, you know, that you had this permanent visa in Tessie de Soleil. Um, what other kinds of stories about, about how you could do what you did? Uh, well, it was not always easy. Um, when I said we were carried by, uh, uh, by you know, people, we were carried by government, that's for sure, and we found ourselves several times uh, becoming the story. In spite of us, we became the story. And uh, there was uh, one uh, uh, things I thing I still remember, one event I still remember, uh, on uh, the eve of um, the elections uh, of 1987, uh, we were uh, covering the news. We were, uh, uh, the whole newsroom, we were all working as journalists, to cover, you know, like doing background paper on different regions of the country uh, before we actually added the, uh, the actuality from the election itself, which was to, supposed to take place the next morning. Uh, starting at 10 o'clock at night, though, they started telling us that, uh, that armed men had started to uh, put, f you know, to set fire into electoral uh, uh, voting places, uh, set fire into electoral uh, bureaus, or uh, to the house, the homes of electoral council members. And uh, we could see from the top of Radio Haiti, uh, we could see fires all throughout the city. And then uh, late in the evening, the newsroom, we became warriors. From journalists, we found ourselves throwing rocks at armed men who were actually shooting at the station. And uh, it, was, it was amazing how uh, an old timer had thought of uh, packing rocks on top of the station. And what was even better? Uh, and uh, I think it, uh, uh, we managed to express the way we felt, which we cannot always do in reporting that are, that are supposed to be objective. But we started throwing rocks at the armed men and it was such a joy to see them running. And they came back several times during the night, until in the morning, uh, a little late uh, in the morning, uh, armed men had attacked uh, electoral bureau at uh, uh, Ruel Vaillant, which is, uh, uh, and they killed people. They started shooting on people waiting in line to vote. Then we knew the election was over. Um, that day we didn't broadcast because uh, uh, our station had been, they had shot at the uh, antenna. Uh, and uh, we uh, evacuated the station when Jean received a call from a friend telling him, you have to get out, they are coming for you. And uh, later on it was the army itself that started shooting on the station. At the time, uh, Nanfi, uh, Regala, and the military junta uh, were uh, determined to seize power, which they did. It was no longer the democratic military. It was, uh, uh, they had decided to uh, drown the, the election in blood with uh, the help of the Makuts from the Duvalier years. Uh, and that was the end of uh, a season, uh, apparently democratic season. And uh, um, so when I said we became the news, it has hap it happened so many times that we, it's a blurred line between uh, being a journalist and being a target. Being a journalist and uh, trying to be objective, trying to sort the facts from different uh, places, and at the same time having yourself to be a target and to, uh, um, you know, be shot at and um, arrested 
And, uh, and it happened all throughout the years, you know. In uh, 1980, uh, uh, they arrested Compe Philo, one of our journalists. And uh, Jean uh, stood at the radio and said, uh, you have to free. I mean, it was a confrontation, a direct confrontation with the Duvalier regime when he said, you have to free Compe Philo. There were so many voices. You know, people in the streets started getting so angry about the fact that they had arrested Compe Philo, who was a very, um, a very popular journalist, that the government had to free him. But they never forgot that. And when they came for us, they destroyed our microphone and everything else at the station. So we wouldn't be able to say, free this one and free that one. So it's... Uh, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, as I said, a thin line between uh, becoming part of the story and covering the story. Uh, we have had so many uh, cases in which, uh, uh, you know, the background story was uh, for us uh, taking place uh, inside. We would talk about a number of things. Strategy, which I don't think a U.S. reporter uh, discusses in the newsroom. You know, strategy, how far you can go and how far, what you can cover, uh, because several times, you know, the, the stick came back. I mean, the repression came back under different forms, whether it was under the military regimes or under, uh, you know, uh, even under so-called democratic governments, uh, where you have rogue elements who actually uh, can exert violence. And journalists have always been targets. In our case, uh, one of our reporters, uh, you know, after Jean was killed, one of our reporters had been doing a story on another um, member of Congress who had been killed. And uh, uh, I knew I am the one who directed the investigative, investigative story. And he actually went on the ground to, uh, you know, he was the voice of that reporting. And he was uh, attacked in a gas station, you know, uh, three days after the reporting was aired. So it's, uh, uh, it was, you know, always, uh, you know, there were always difficulties. And uh, when uh, um, you asked me about um, the motivation earlier about the journalist, uh, of the journalist, I think that uh, those stories, uh, also this uh, constant, uh, being in constant, uh, in constant danger, uh, was also part of the solidarity. You just, telling each other how things went and how difficult it was. And, and, uh, um, and uh, they would talk to me like one of our reporters was arrested in Cité Soleil because, and his uh, uh, equipment was broken. And I said, okay, this time around, we are going to the, to, the, uh, just, to the justice system and we're going to demand that you get your equipment back from the police. And we did exactly that. I went down with them uh, and I said, to, to, I went to the uh, prosecutor and I said, this is what happened and we demand this, okay? When we came back to the newsroom with that reporter, I said, okay, now we have to assign someone to Cité Soleil because the, the, the gang wars were still going on. And uh, I said, uh, who is willing to go? It's dangerous, you know it's dangerous, who is willing to go? And then there was that voice of uh, Jean-Robert Delcinier, who was the reporter who had been uh, uh, you know, mal mistreated by the police. And he says, but Michel, this is my story. You don't have the right to give it to someone else. And that's it. That was his story. It's to tell you that um, you know, a lot of things went into the newsroom that were the background behind the stories. Uh, I, would, I could tell you thousands of stories behind every single one of the recordings we have at Duke now, uh, where uh, different things happened every time. And they were not on the air, because uh, we could not cover them, you know. Uh, people who, were, uh, uh, who came to your uh, uh, office with their uh, guns, put their guns on your table and said, ask you to rectify your story, even though they had themselves uh, uh, declared that they had killed so many people. Uh, you simply had aired their voices and they came to, for you to rectify. Uh, so you had th things like this all the time. But ever since I worked as a journalist, I had known that. Even covering um, the theater, when I was a reporter at Le Nouvelliste, the paper. You know, I remember one day, one um, playwright 
came to the office, to the, the, he didn't know who I was. He thought Michel Montas was a man. So he came in, put his revolver on the table of the poor secretary, and said, who is that, where is that Michel Montas? And the secretary didn't be, bat an eyelash. She says, well, she's out in the street now. She's not here. I was right behind her. And so, I don't know where he is, you know. Why? Because I had written, I had criticized a play he had written. So it was always that, you know. I mean, danger <laughs> was part of the territory from the start, from day one. And it was, uh, except that somehow it became more unpredictable, you know, after the fall of Duvalier. Because under Duvalier, you knew where it was going to come from. It came from the same people. It could come after that, from 1906 on, it could come from different, different sectors. And uh, uh, when uh, Jean was killed, it was under a democratic, in a democratic season, under a democratic regime. So you, you know, the, the danger become, became more diffuse, but it was always part of the territory. What do you think that the actual Radio Haiti building came to represent um, for people, the physical structure? Uh, or what different roles did it play? Well, I think it played different roles. When we were uh, uh, at the Rue du Quai downtown, where the first Radio Haiti was, uh, we were not the first, the second Radio Haiti was, um, you know, we were also a place of uh, refuge where people came. Uh, we were uh, like an embassy. You know, I mean, uh, uh, it was not the uh, the building that you saw after that. It was a, there were small studios uh, before they were destroyed completely in 1980. People would come. There was a flood in Lagonave, and suddenly refugees would come to the station because that's what they do. They knew the government would not do anything for them. They knew uh, they, were, they didn't know where to turn. And I found myself a reporter in a radio station, you know, holding a baby who had been left by a mother who was a, refu was a refugee from the flood in Lagonave. So you found yourself, you know, uh, in that building where uh, also, you know, students demonstrating against uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier, or, well, this demonstrating against the Ministry of Education about uh, um, the outcome of state exams uh, were pursued by the police because the police told them they didn't have the right to demonstrate, and they took refuge at Radio Haiti. And uh, it was, there were long hours of negotiation between the police surrounding the building and the uh, students inside, and Jean, because Jean was the one negotiating. So finally, an agreement was, uh, you know, they arrived at an agreement, and Jean had to take escort two or three students student at a time home. And the police let him do that, but they kept the siege of the station until all the students were out. Things like this happened. Things like that happened all the time. And uh, that was one building. Then there was another building, which is the one that we lived in from 90, uh, 1994 on which was the big building uh, with uh, the three stories and uh, uh, the veve in front. The veve is the um, symbol, the voodoo symbol, uh, which was uh, uh, with a microphone on it, which became also the symbol of, uh, of our fight for justice, became a symbol of uh, um, the people who were defending, and people knew they could come to the station any time. That's probably why. Uh, when uh, Jean's assassin came into the, into the yard, no one stopped him. What are some of your your favorite memories about the station, about the work, or um, broadcasts, reports that really that particularly stay with you? It's difficult to answer that. As I said, uh, uh, you know, I mean. Uh, Every day was special, every day was different. Uh, behind every story, there was a story. 
like they say in Haiti, behind a mountain. There is always another mountain. Um, uh, the, what I got most excited about were the uh, in-depth report, packaging a story into why it happened, packaging a story into uh, what are the consequences for others, uh, which is what I'm, I like the most about what we did. Uh, it was not about the daily coverage, it was more about the in-depth stories that grew out of the daily coverage. Um, most of the, the great anecdotes came from the newsroom, you know, from uh, the story behind the story. Example. For example, I, I told you about the time when we, uh, you know, we were, uh, uh, we had to uh, become uh, fighters, uh, <laughs> throwing rocks at uh, uh, armed men. Uh, I can tell you thousands of stories of, uh, um, you know, uh, being in the street. Uh, uh, I can remember right now when uh, um, there was a coup in Haiti, an attempted coup, right after the election of Jean-Bertrand Aristide uh, to the presidency, which was the first really free election, and uh, where Jean-Bertrand Aristide had an overwhelming majority of votes. And uh, um, there was a former Duvalierist called Roger Lafontaine who uh, attempted a coup. He attempted while uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide was not at the palace yet. Uh, he uh, took over the national palace. And uh, so uh, the next morning, the streets were covered with people, people who wanted to stop uh, Roger Lafontaine. And he was there in the palace, and then there were thousands of people in the streets. And they had barricades with rocks, with uh, uh, tires, uh, b burning tires all over the city of uh, uh, Port-au-Prince. And I remember Jean and I coming out of our, of, of our ho home, which was uh, downtown, and uh, uh, finding the streets totally blocked. And uh, a guy said, hey, Radio Haiti, you want to get to the station? We'll get you there. And one of the guys, with his lambi in his hand, the lambi is the conch shell, which they use as um, a trumpet. He was sitting on the, 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 the car, on the hood, and we were crossing barricades after barricades. Then he would just say, uh, Radio Haiti, and that's it. They would dismantle the barricades so we could go through. And of course it took, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes to reach the station, which was uh, uh, in Delma. Uh, which would have been a 10-minute ride, but uh, we got there. We got there and we got there through all the barricades. Uh, because of that relationship of trust that was established, uh, people knew that we couldn't have been on the side of the coup, and they were there to help us talk about it, say things about it, and uh, report on it. And... Uh, uh, those are, uh, there are so many anecdotes behind the daily lives of the station, or behind, because that daily life was also about this. Demonstrations about people uh, uh, wanting change and not getting it. Is there a particular broadcast or, um, or series or event that you covered that you really feel that Radio Haiti's reporting contributed to social change? 